Oh man, panda, panda, panda. I've been waiting for this conversation for a little while. After that, the pandas had reemerged earlier, I think it was earlier this year in uh, January 2022. I'm here with Kevin Mifiko. They're two of the community leaders and reviving one of the historic panda projects, which I believe is the first Chinese NFT, or at least the first that we've uncovered so far, or from, from Asian descent, which we'll go into. Very big fan of community revived projects. I previously had on、uh, Realms of Ether on here, have been doing very well. I think we're going to see some sort of similar success with, it, with Kevin Mifiko behind the helm and the rest of the community、uh, driving the pandas forward. So, gentlemen, thank you for joining me. Thank you, Jake. Thank you for having us. It's an honor, it's a blessing. And、uh, we were just talking before we got on how. The, the story of these early relics n e e d to be told. And whoever's listening 50 years from now,、um, thank you for listening. The, the, this is why we're recording this right now. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So I, I kind of find it funny because I, when I first got into NFTs, I really started like looking into the creator side. Kev was actually one of the first people outside of a- Adam who was interviewing historical, historical creators and people in the space. And then it seems like you kind of found home with the pandas. So we could just start with Kev. Is what spoke to you about the pandas to kind of really dive into this specific project and help revive it and then also build a community around it? Yeah, awesome. So I've, I've gotten podcasting. I've, I've just been real busy、um, helping the pandas and some other projects. So I kind of put podcasting on the back burner、um, for a little bit. But as far as the panda story,、um, I, I love to tell it. It starts back in January, around January 14th or January 15th, when、uh, Gary V first entered Adam McBride's.、Mm-hmm. Archaeologist Discord. This was a time when Gary V entered Discord.、Uh, everybody was shilling Gary. Every historical project you could think of that's running through your head right now, people were shilling him left and right. It was the biggest shill fest I've ever seen in the Discord. And amongst the shilling of everybody shilling Gary V、uh, hope, in hopes that he, he picks one of their projects or he pumps one of their bags, he acts. He, 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 he quotes,、uh, Tell me the story of the pandas. It, it was something along that line. And from there, the very next day, people's like, Hold up, Gary asked about the pandas. What are the pandas? Somebody dropped the link in the Discord about the pandas. A couple of us start going, like, kind of looking through it. And it's like, Yo, this art's pretty fucking cute. So we, we like the art. And then one, it goes from one guy saying, Yeah, I just brought one for point, for point,、um, for point one. And then another person, and then before you know it, there's like hundreds of people who just aped into the panda. So、um, it got to the point where we kind of overtook Adam McBride's Discord and we just started talking panda. So I'm like, you know what? Let me go ahead and, and create a, a panda Discord. So I went in and I created a different panda Discord. So we kind of、uh, transitioned to the new panda herb Discord. And, and from there,、um, community leaders just started coming, coming, like just started stepping up. People just started stepping up. It was like, yeah, I could help create a Discord. I could help, you know, mod the Discord. I could help. You know, do, just do all types of different things. And from there, you know,、um, I, I give all the credit to the community. I created the Discord, but man, the community really took the project and gave it a vision, including guys like、uh, Mafiko, X Art, Pix, who are some of the other、uh, mods, Ox Drew. And they all came together and we kind of just made this vision of what we wanted Panda Earth to be. And、uh, that's my side of the story. I'll let Mafiko kind of share, share his perspective. Yeah, man. I mean, that's,、uh, that's exactly how it went down, Kev. It's it kind, of, it it kind of crazy. I thought it would come in a couple of months. But for me, very much the same. I saw the link someone dropped, and, and I was literally just in the right place, right time. I think I was, I just finished dinner. So I was just walking to, to put my, my, my dishes in the, in the, in the dishwasher. And I、uh, saw this panda link. And, and I've learned in, in, in NFT land that you know, these kind of opportunities, You've got to jump at these opportunities. Obviously, you've got to be mindful of, of security and, and being rugged and scammed and those kind of things. But there's just these kind of unique things where if someone just drops a link and then just things go crazy. And I saw the pandas and, you know, putting my historical hat on, I hadn't seen another collection of this kind. So for me, I started, when I started reading about it, I was like, wow, there's a conservation angle to this project. I don't know many other historical projects that have a conservation angle. The founders were from China. I don't know many other 
historical projects that have a, 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 you know, an origin story around China. So for me, all these kind of like alarm bells are going on in my head. I'm like, this is, this could be a really, a really interesting project. And the art work as well is what really gripped me in a sense that very, very ahead of his time. If you look at some of the other projects around the 2018 era, this artwork, Panda Earth artwork is, is as good as anything you would see in 2021, 2022. So when I, when I combined all those elements, artwork and, and, and all the potential historical significance and at the price point, I, I got my skeleton, skeleton Panda, which is one of the rarest in the collection for 0.15. I was like, that's a no brainer. So I ate and I only managed, I only had enough eat for my skeleton Panda. Um, but then yeah, I posted in the discord and people were like, wow, this thing's sick. Then it just took off. Kev set up the Discord, and then uh, I was was there in the early days with Kev on on we had a couple of Twitter Twitter spaces and stuff. And then uh, woke up the next day. I was like, oh hey Kev, can I you know can I be a community mod? And then the rest the rest is history. Now we're 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 we're, we're, we're yeah we've been building the past couple of months. Yeah, it's not funny how it happens, especially within the the historical spaces. You just get so wrapped up within the community. Kev starts a Discord, and you're stuck with it. That reminds me of uh, Justin Trimble when he opened up the the Mooncats Discord and kind of got stuck being the leader, even though it's it he everyone kind of noticed that he was uninterested as he was starting his own projects. And we see this ha- <laughs> happen and happen again. And with, with your piece too, you get tied in with the community, but then also you're incentivized because you, you hop in early, you get one of the rare pieces and then some other components of it speak to you. Like you said, with the, the conservation and I, I have this here, I think one, somebody in the community made this, the Panda Earth FAQ that I have up on the screen um, it was created in May 4th, 2018. I believe it was like some sort of play to earn game. Yeah, first blockchain game that was created in China. And what I've begun to notice now is towards the end of 2017, like December 2017 through like the first half of 2018 is we really see a lot of these play to earn games um, starting to pop up. And it doesn't seem like any of them really survived or they took a break, which was similar. But from my understanding, this dev just completely rug the game or um, do you, do you, can you guys fill in the gap of what happened with the dev or what the community is aware of? You can take that one, Mafiko. <laughs> yeah, no problem. So yeah, so so what happened, um, what we were able to do when, once Kev created the Discord, we went into sort of in investigation, invest, uh, sort of put our investigators hat on and we went to, to search more about, you know, learn more about the project. We try to contact the, the initial devs and were unsuccessful in doing so. We did find the old Discord that they had back in 2018. And reading through those messages, it became clear to us that this, the devs had abandoned the project. So I, I don't know if they necessarily rugged the project, but it, it, it was clear from those Discord messages that they just all of a sudden left um, and they left the holders back then high and dry. So. Uh, not sure why it wasn't clear what their reasons for, for leaving were, um, but they just decided to abandon the project. And, and that was, uh, that was the, situ- the situation. We went to, to, to extensive lengths to, to try to find the devs. We, we, uh, reached out to various people through, uh, Chinese social media. So WeChat. we ended up finding one of, one of the, the, uh, team members from, from back in the day. Um, and we were unsuccessful. She did doesn't know the devs. So we were unsuccessful in, 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 in finding them. So that really left us in a, in a tricky situation where, well, no devs, but it's really cool, cool NFTs, but no way and, and no way of, of, of sort of reviving the project in, in, in a traditional sense. So we had to be then yeah creative about how to, how to go about that. Wow. You guys went all the way through WeChat. Was there some sort of translator that you had used to, to communicate with uh, the Chinese on the other side? Kev, do you remember what we did that? I think we reached out to, we found somebody who spoke English. She was from Hong Kong or something like that. Yeah, yeah. It, it was a bilingual a bilingual person. Okay. Wow, that's that's amazing. And one thing I noticed too with, with Panda Earth is when it was being revived, a lot of people were aping into what I have on the screen where it says content not available. As you can see, some people bought it for 0.05, 0.04 um, because they thought they were getting something completely cheap. But they're... I think it's, is it an error within the contract where these images don't render and then is leading into the, the next topic we'll talk about with the, the wrapping? 
So, so that one, so yeah, we've had this whole, and we call them dead pandas. <laughs> we, <laughs> we've had a situation with these. So basically what happened with the dead pandas is, is um, the, the old, the metadata was, I guess, stored or, or um, on the developer's um, uh, service. When they abandoned the project, that, that sort of link um, ceased to, to, yeah, continue to exist. And so OpenSea just archived or was able to capture as much of the metadata as possible. The, the dead pandas are ones that never had artwork in the initial instance. So the devs are still kind of building out the project and, and trying to, you know, build it out to 6,000, 6.6K supply. They never had artwork back in 2018. And so when OpenSea just captured everything, this is what we, we, we end up with. The situation for us though is, is obviously you've got the pandas, which are, you know, have got the artwork and it's great. And the mentality of people being in the NFT space, when you see content, content not available yet, you're thinking, oh, this is a pre-reveal kind of NFT. It's cheap right now. Let me buy, let me ape into this. And then, you know, it's going to be revealed later, which is not in our case. And we've, we've, we've communicated that as much as we can on, on Discord, on, on Twitter, but still people are buying into them. So that was one of the big reasons for us in terms of coming up with a creative approach moving forward to the project is that the, the dead pandas credit situation where our floor price is, is artificial, well, it's, it's lower than it otherwise should be. If you look at what the dead pandas are going for, 0 0.05 or something, but our actual floor is much is, is higher than that, but it just creates a bad perception of the collection. And also if people continue to buy into these dead pandas, it creates a situation for us where we've got disgruntled holders, even though we've been clear and communicating these things, it's just not a great position to be in. So that was definitely one thing we wanted to, to fix. And as you can see, Jake, when you search for Panda Earth, another thing, you can't even find the collection on OpenSea. So all these problems, is that not, it's actually a miracle. I'm, 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 I'm so proud of the community in the sense of how we're able to do about 500 ETH in volume with all these headwinds, right? Dead pandas, uh, you can't find us in OpenSea. Literally word of mouth, basically, people finding the pandas. Uh, and our Twitter, which isn't that big, and our Discord as well. So that's that's what we've been dealing with. Yeah, it's it's absolutely incredible. I wonder why that is. I wonder if it's Open Sea censoring them because of its past of a potential rug. Uh, it's kind kind of interesting. Maybe it has to do with the IP coming from from the east. It's very very interesting. Uh, let's dive a little bit into the rarities because what I had on screen is I put up uh, the highest last sale, and you can see there's. There's some robots, there's the schools that you possess, and then this like like Japanese inspired bride. Yeah, yeah. bride type panda. But what I what I noticed is a lot of them look the same. They almost look very identical. So it makes me wonder, are they ERC seven twenty ones? Are they eleven fifty fives? And then when you go into this like well put together document that somebody, the FAQ somebody did in the community, man, probably put a lot of time into this. Uh, it mentions that there is a breeding component and different generations similar to CryptoKDs that was released about six months before them. Also, it says that pandas have names, which is uh, moon cats about eight months before them. So it looks like they're inspired from uh, and pulling from a handful of these different projects that that came before them. It's, it's quite unique. And then they tie in the, the conservation. Um, is there... Can, can either of you just explain the, the simple rarities through um, just co co common conversation for those who are, who are listening and not watching on YouTube? Okay, if you want to take this one? Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and take that. So the, the most rare pandas, actually, if you kind of want to go on the OpenSea collection um, and you want to just click on one of them and go to, um, go to the traits, um, if you go to the main, the main collection, Okay. We'll, we'll, On the yeah, side. let's just yeah, let's just do a, a walkthrough, um, and that way it could help me collect my thoughts as well. So go to type. So right there on on guardian so the main collection the main the most rare ones are considered if you want to click on guardians um are the guardian pandas these are unique one of ones uh the devs made about 50 of these but they're forever lost because they're all 50 of them are held in the developer's wallet 
And these guardians were were basically created um, to help fund the conservation efforts that were going that was going to be used, you know, to help with the panda con- uh, conservation. So these are considered to be the most rare, the most majestical, the one of ones. And we now use the guardians for cool things like I have it as my picture on this podcast, we use it for for cool. I have it as my building wrap in Aether City. Uh, we use it as the official Twitter. So we kind of consider these guardians to be watching over the collection. No one will ever own them, but they have the sickest artwork and they are the most rare within the collection. Um, so that's a little backstory about the guardians. Absolutely sick art. The next is the robots, the skeletons, and then the bride um, is our next. And those are all pretty much the same. Um, well, each category is the same and there, there's several different ones of each, but that's how the rarities go. And then, and then after that is ranked from generation zero to generation eight. It is considered that obviously generation zero would be the most rare or, or I should say the most um, pure and Gen 8 would be with through breeding mechanisms and, and breeding your pandas. Gen 8 would be the least pure, aka less rare. But one thing we realized within the community, because the, the game got abandoned so early, Gen 8 actually has the least amount as compared to if the game was actually continuing. So the original uh, uh, mission was for the lower generations to be more rare. And obviously through continuous breeding, the higher generations will be, will be um, more rare less rare so this so it's up to the community um but gen 8 there's only two gen 8s as you can see and those are probably considered pretty rare um in this occasion so rare rarity that's kind of a basic breakdown of of the rarity of of the pandas and uh with the skeletons not the skeletons the guardians being at the the very top of the rarity list that nobody would ever own and they're kind of just washing over us all yeah it is this is quite unique i like the i like the guardians I know, and we'll get into this about the wrapping. Was there ever a debate within the community to fork the project instead of wrapping it so that you could essentially revive these guardians? There was. There there was um, debate on whether or not we wanted to kind of see if there's a way to kind of bring these guardians to the new collection uh, along with the, the rewrap. But I think we just decided it's best to kind of just leave them alone keep its historical providence. Uh, don't even touch them. Let's not even try to touch them and just kind of just let them watch over us, you know? Um, and I think it adds to the providence and the story of what this project is and to archaeologists and, and collectors who are interested um, w- w- when they, when they dive and research this project, they, they'll, they'll know that these, these ancient relics have, will never be touched. Yeah. This, 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 um, this one that I'm looking at with the scythe is sick. And the name is written in, in Chinese, it appears. Or all of these guardians, actually. Uh, the name is written in Chinese, it appears. So I'm just adding to the name. But it, it looks sounds like the, the trade-off then is, since you're deciding to wrap and not retrieving these guardians, you can then utilize them if the, the plan of the project is to implement some sort of CCO where anyone can use anything. Um, or maybe something similar to... Mooncats, where every individual owner owns the rights to that mooncat, or not to the mooncat, to the panda, and then these become the the community mascots. As you mentioned, you have them on the side of the Aether or Ether City uh, building, and some of the other the marketing components to it. Um, that's a pretty pretty cool trade off. I haven't seen that happen yet. Yeah, correct. So so we, as far as we're concerned now, we you do own the rights to your panda. Um, and the, like, yeah, anybody's free and welcome to use the guardians as, as they like within the collection is just kind of how we've been, um, we've been moving forward with that. Yeah. I, I like this. So here we have the team. I'm looking at the team component. I'm literally just scrolling down the, the FAQ list for those who are, who are listening. We have Kev that's, that's running it. Um, how long did it take the community to kind of, um, figure out the the niches and the the different positions um, for everyone to take on? Was it just general discussion? Was there some sort of voting um, or a, a DAO that was created, which we see in some of these historical projects? Uh, what was that discussion like? I think natural leaders ultimately just stepped up, you know, when, when after I created this discord, um, X art reached out to me 
Glee reached out, Mafiko reached out, uh, Pix reached out. All these guys reached out and said, you know, I want to be part of this. I want to take the leadership role and do this. From there, the main people who reached out, we decided to, to make some sort of mod chat. And then we just started digging and, and getting to work and grinding from there. Within that mod chat that we created, you know, we kind of uh, learned and discovered each other's strengths, who's good at what, uh, who could take on which roles, how can we get the community evolved? And that's kind of how we got to the point that we are now. But the, the natural natural leaders just kind of stepped up and, and reached out and said, this is what I want to do. And this is how I can help. And, and man, it has been a blessing, absolute blessing working alongside these guys and with this community because, you know, I've learned so much being a part of this project from these guys. Um, that I, I that the experience is invaluable of of what I what I was what I'm able to to learn from Panda Earth and, and working alongside this community. Yeah, you guys, you guys have definitely been making some movements. And speaking of that, March second, which is recently, we we also had this discussion on Twitter Spaces before about how to go about wrapping. We've seen it go really good with some projects, and we've seen it go terribly awful and ultimately just crumble the project. It seems like as a community guys decided that there's going to be a reward to encourage those who own pandas to wrap into the new contract, which we'll talk about in a second for some of the benefits. What was the decision or um, the contemplations um, within the community around just simply giving out a PO app versus something different, which could have you could have easily divvied up royalties or done something differently? So this yeah. one was yeah. Go ahead, yeah, go. I was gonna say this one was we're you know we're in a tricky situation with Panda Earth. I I, I feel like um, a lot of projects that wrap still have I guess, I, I guess either existing developers and and have a treasury of NFTs that they can use for for different things. Panda Earth we don't have a treasury, don't have many, we don't don't have any assets really. So we had to think outside the box in terms of what we could offer as an incentive in the short term for, for people to, to wrap and And obviously the, the problems that we're, we're facing makes it a no brainer to wrap, but understanding, understandably other people do require that we, we wanted to put ourselves in the best position to incentivize as many people to wrap. And so thinking on building on what Kev said about the, 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 the guardians and how they're, you know, they're locked away. We then thought about, you know, how can we use that guardian artwork that that is so appealing? But how can how can we use that and put that in the hands of the community in some way, and and still create a, a sort of historic moment, which we believe this this wrapping of of of, of Panda Earth, this revival, is very much a historical moment for 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 the collection. And so, you know, we've got about we looked at at, at EtherScan, got about a thousand holders now. So that we then really spent some time devising the strategy. And, you know, thinking about the 50 guardians that we had, just thinking strategically, which ones could be the best uh, to use. And so you see like, you know, Panda in first 300, right? With like the Leonidas, like the, the, the spot and like bringing in all those different elements. And then we also thought about, well, we have holders who have multiple pandas. And, and obviously they say if all 1000 holders wrap, great, but we only have a thousand pandas. So we wanted to also incentivize people to wrap multiple pandas. And so that's when we, we created a pop for that as well. And so if all of this goes ahead to plan, we have you know a lot of our holders wrapping, but also then we have holders with multiple pandas wrapping, which which create puts us in 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 our best position to to have a good supply on the other side. Yeah, this makes sense. Yeah, I, now I like that you explained that because I was thinking that this was just wrapped pandas, but this is actually holders. And so it's a direct reflection of, of the ownership and that you're, you're leaning into the guardian PO app. Um, I have, I think I have like five pandas, so I'm going to be excited to see, um, the guardian PO app. Did you use all 50 of them or is it just one, one guardian for the, for this specific PO app? Just one, just one guardian for that specific PO app. Um, yeah, we, 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 we just used the, yeah, we, we, we picked one we thought was best. And you can see the Guardian Pro up, you kind of got the little baby pandas that are like levitating. And we thought like the, the mage panda would, would it made, you know, it made sense. That like, quite that levitating off the ground. So just for, for, from a design perspective, uh, but also that leaves us then with, with a great opportunity going forward 
where we still have those other guardians that we can use creatively for other different things. And is the, the, does the Pull app exist on, I think it's called X chain or, or something like that. Is that um, where it's going to come through? Yeah. So I'm not sure. I think it's pull XYZ is the something. website. I'm not sure what, what chain specifically that's on, but there is the, they, they have the, the um, ability to, to transfer migrate that to, to Ethereum if people want to do that as well. So, and, and will this pull app, is there any, is there any discussion around um, additional utility um, for this pull app or is this just going to be more of a badge of honor type thing? That's a good question, Jake. And right now uh, it's, it's a badge of honor thing. And at our plan is after we've, we've, we've gone over the hill with the wrap, we've, we've taken stock of, you know, the supply and, and majority of our holders are, are, are over the other side for us to then ask the community, what would you like to see? And for us as well as, as, as a management team to think creatively around how can we instead, how can we uh, reward or, uh, or provide additional utility to holders? So we, we definitely, part of our DAO proposal was very much focused on if you wrap your Panda, you get to the, you cross the other side that all additional value and utility will be going towards those people who've got rap pandas. So that's very much top of mind for us. That's awesome. I saw in the comments, Adam, asked, Adam was asking when the rapper goes live, which is next week, which is around the time of us recording this. So this will probably be out. What direct benefits does the community re- receive or the leaders once pandas are wrapped? For example, here and let me let me add a little bit of an example. So, just from my personal experience within the Mooncats community, it took us almost, I think, six months to get to about seventy five percent wrapped or seventy percent wrapped. I believe it's closer to eighty now. I'm um, at this time, so probably won't ever reach a hundred. Um, but the good part about pandas is there, I believe there's some still locked up on the original contract. So maybe you only need 5,000. Um, what is there going to be a different royalty that goes to the community DAO? Um, and then what are some of the, the future plans um, within the new wrapper? Yeah, great question, uh, Jake. So yeah, definitely uh, in terms of royalties, we're a 5.5 maybe I'm getting that wrong, 5.5% uh, royalty would be going towards the, the DAO. Um, bear with me, I'm getting my math. I want to make sure I got my maths right. Ah, 6%, 6%, sorry. 6% royalty would be going towards the DAO. And so our part of our DAO proposal there was, was looking at different, different elements of that. So right now we're, we're, we're broadly working with, with 2% being, being earmarked to uh, conservation efforts. So we want to, support panda conservation efforts or, or wildlife conservation efforts more broadly. And it was a specific uh, focus for us to, to broaden that out to, to endangered wildlife because we believe that provides us more opportunities to, to, to engage with other NFT collections that are animal related, but also in terms of panda conservation over the past couple of years has, has, been, has been successful and pandas are, are becoming less and less endangered. So we want to also look to support additional additional wildlife um, uh, efforts. So 2% for wild, wildlife conservation, 2% for investments, whether that's in, so that's, whether that's historical NFTs or other, 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 other investments that will be of, of benefit to, to holders. And then 2% for, for operations. And by operations, I mean if we need to recruit other additional people, junior mods, those kind of things, marketing, those kind of things that we need. So 6% in total to the DAO. And then 1.5% to, to, the, to the, the founding management team. So myself, Kev, Pixelize, um, and Exart as well. And that's for us, for, for the ongoing management of this project. Uh, we very much believe in this project. We, we want to be with this project for the long term. Um, and we've been working on the basis of, you know, it's funny, Exart, I believe, didn't even have a panda in the beginning when he became a mod. Someone actually had to, someone had to send him <laughs> had to send him a panda. So so and very all of us actually have. I've got two. I know Kev's got one. So we we're not big holders of this project. We we really believe in this project. We want to you know be a part of this thing. So yeah, that's what we're looking at. Six percent Dow, one point five percent to the management team. Wow, I think that even um, shows 
the character within the leadership team that the pe- the community the leaders who are running it have less than three um, individually because that's something that we see a lot of historical critics um, say within Twitter and online is that people are just reviving these historical projects because they're just trying to pump their own bags. But now you're just saying, <laughs> <laughs> right? I see this. I literally just had a discussion today with this with somebody about it, and I I tell them that. A lot of a lot of us that are in the historical space, we're not interested in minting wars. That's more of a gamble and reviving these these older projects. First, if you could find the dev, which I'm pretty sure every project that I've seen has attempted to at least contact the dev. Um, you give them a second chance, an opportunity of living out their dream. And then if not, the community um, forms around it. You don't have to build a project and you could kind of continue on the narrative or just fork it into into your own direction. And one last thing I'm going to mention to you before I let Kev talk is 1.5% to the team is actually quite low comparative to what I've seen on many of these other projects. So I think I'd be remiss to say that nobody's going to work for free. So 1.5%, it's a half a percent per person. We're all incentivized at the end of the day to work. No one's going to work for free. So um, very generous contribution from, from the team. Yeah, definitely. Um, And so uh, two, two points I want to talk about. Um, so with Panda Earth, you know, we're starting from zero. So when people see that or how much fees we're, 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 we're accumulating, we're starting from zero. We're starting from nothing in the treasury. We don't have any pandas to give out. Like other projects, you know, they kind of could put a couple of their own, their project in their own DAO and things of that nature. So starting from zero, we kind of have to go a little bit higher on the fee side so we could, you know, be able to run this project efficiently. And another interesting thing I want to talk about is um, the idea of pumping your own bags of people, like people rediscovering projects to pump their own bags. I think we all pump our own bags. You know, I, I think it's, it's, it's a normal human thing to pump your own bags. And if you're someone who's early enough and has enough business acumen or enough credibility or enough, you know, a good enough storytelling to go in and, um, and pump your bags or to, to basically revive a project, then, then why not do it? Because if you don't, someone else is going to come along and do it. And this is the amazing picture of Adam McBride. Who, so who, has, who has, um, I seen Adam and Leonidas get a ton of fudge. Shout out to Adam McBride. He is a panda holder. He holds several pandas. Um, but like, for example, Adam McBride has gotten a ton of fud for basically quote unquote pumping his bags because he kind of rediscovered these projects and people kind of ape in, but I, I don't see nothing wrong with that. If, um, because if you don't do it, another archaeologist will come around and do it. So that's my take on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is kind of within the the own historical space is where we start debating semantics um, because now we've seen the word historical um, kind of been thrown around a lot and applied to some of these newer projects, um, which there can be a newer project with historical significance. I think I think it's pretty pretty certain that Board Eight Yacht Club is going to be a historical project, um, if not now. Like, right? It's been a modernized cultural phenomenon. It's incredible to actually see that kind of stuff. But then we get into the semantic debate of what actually is significant. Is it age? Is it is it does it have to do with with the geographic culture or internet culture or a rediscovery? There's so many different ideas: on chain, off chain, storage. Yep. That, I think this is, I think to me, that's kind of the fun part to it. A lot of people don't like it um, or get turned off by it and kind of turn into a maximalist for their own project. But running across these chains and finding different communities is, is completely awesome, especially once you realize, once you start balance, balancing around between a lot of these projects that it's a pretty small community with the majority of the same people. Yeah. And I, I want to touch that as well. That, that That's a really good, what is historical, you know, and everybody's going to have their own definition because there's no government rule that states this is what historical is. I just want to give a background about myself and, and what I've been collecting and things of that nature is I started off my first NFT that I brought, I purchased was Kira cards. And I brought it because of its, its historical provenance of it being the first art on Ethereum. And I kind of went to Pepe's and and so forth and so on. So I, I collected a bunch of 2017, 2018, 2016 NFTs first. Um, I got that out the way. And the reason I did that is because 
my thesis was these super early projects on the blockchain are going to be very high, highly sought after collectibles um, in the future. So there has been a new narrative forming around uh, people calling early PFP projects, early 10K collections historical. And it kind of uh, tickled some feathers of hardcore historical collectors. In my opinion, it probably tickled those feathers because those guys, you know, want to, want to, uh, they're protecting their bags. Um, coming from a historical background where, where I haven't sold not one of my historical NFTs and the only NFTs I plan on selling is, uh, I'm trying to sell some of my NFTs right now so I could get in, so I could get a crypto skull. I really want one of those, but the moral story I'm trying to, I'm trying to make is, I did collect some of the early 10K uh, PFP projects because it goes back to the idea of, I think those could be highly sought after collectibles in the future. And, and for me, that is quote unquote historical. And that's that's kind of how I'm viewing that definition. Of, but, but we are are entitled to our own opinion. And, and I'm pretty sure we all will, will look at the term historical and put our own little twist to it. Yeah, complete, completely agree with it. Um, within the new one in the supply, this is a debate that I've been having online and within different discords um, with the 10K PFP. Is, is a supply metric a, a proper uh, valuation to, to signify something as historical? Like, for example, I try to go, whenever I go into this digital world, I try to think of things that exist in the real world before it. And I was like, was there ever a time where a 10,000 baseball collection set was considered historical or more valuable um, outside of like complete scarcity, right? If something's a one of one or one of 10, it obviously has value because not many people can hold it. But if many people can hold it, then what is the point to, to add more value? And then, then I go on the other side and I'm like, well, we're moving into this completely digital world where we're, it's based off of internet culture and mimetic desire and crypto punks kind of set everything off. And if they're going to eventually be a million dollars per, then obviously some, there's going to be some sort of like trickle down effect to where other things that are very similar to it, whether it's the supply or the traits or the PFP um, are going to capture some of that value as well. And yeah. that's, that's the, the fun part. It does become irritating, but um, I think it's, it's proper that we have these debates um, or else we'll never get past each other. So, and, and another perspective on that, I think that that's a good point to make is when we look at NFTs and, and the three of us, when we first got into NFTs, what made, how did NFTs go mainstream and how is NFTs currently going mainstream is I sit and I look at, um, it's profile picture projects, board apes, crypto punks, so forth. I, I can name a ton, but these PFP projects are is what kind of drove mainstream adoption into NFTs. Majority of people don't. Majority of people in NFTs don't even know about historical projects, or they're simply not interested in historical projects because they can't see the vision that me, you, and my fico and probably whoever's listening to his call could see right now, or they're simply not in the in the in the game for waiting five years for their bags to pump so when you think about the modern era of what is the most popular collections they're all pfp collections so now i take that same thesis and i and i that i apply with historical nfts and have a bag a bag load of historical nfts i have you know 20 plus carrier cards you know so i'm i'm, I'm balls deep into this but when i take that that same analysis and that same theory and i go into in five years from now I think a lot of investors and a lot of collectors are going to have the same mindset that we have with the super early assets with super early uh, PFP projects. And, and that's why I like them. And, and I think uh, it's for me, it's all about what is collectible and what can I flip later down the line that will be highly desirable uh, in somebody's cool collection. How about you, Mafika? What's, what's historical significance mean to you? Oh man, this is, this is, this is a million dollar question. So, you know, in, in, in my day job, I'm an academic. So I, I, the semantics, I live in the world of semantics. Like that's what I do. So I came to the NFT world to get out of that word. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I'm very much of the same opinion in the sense that, you know, there's kind of, I, I, I'm also big into, into art, like art history. And so, you know, you have different eras of, of, of history modern history and different kind of eras. And so I, I think, of, I like to think about it that I, I think the, 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 if we're looking at historic and historical NFTs, 2011 and 29, like 2019, 18, 17, 
whatever you, you however people want to define it that just by the nature of there being limited projects in that era that yes that that is that is a good way to frame you know a large part of the historical entities I, I i agree with that i do think 2021 2022 in the future despite there being a proliferation of NFT projects that there are going to be NFT projects that are going to be historical, whether it is they're the first to do something or as you as you mentioned, Jake, they're between, you know, the sort of trickle down effect right between punks and between apes. And if there's a specific amount of entities in that range, there likely will be a sort of association effect or trickle down effect to those collections. So I, 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 I agree. I agree with both. I think there's I find sometimes in the historical space that people can be quite narrow in their views and that's fine. People have, you know, we're we're entitled to our our different opinions. I think that that we're going to see both, but again, we, we all may be wrong and, and we see the market, you know, in, in, in five years time, uh, you know, the Adam, Adam, Leonidas, like all of us, like they're going to be new, new people, new voices in this space. The, the, the discourse that we're currently on now, I'm sure you all remember like before December, before the, the pump, like the historical pump, how many people were in the discord, like the relics and Adam's alpha, like not that many. And even now, not that many, but in five years time, we're going to have, we may not even be on discord, but we're going to have a larger community. So we'll see. Um, we can all, we, we're all sort of, I guess, collecting based on different theses. But I, my opinion is that the historical 2011, 2019, that's definitely a strong thesis. I understand that, but I also understand Modern history, diff- more difficult to 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 discern and figure out what's going on. But I can see that there are going to be some of these 2021, 2022, and onwards uh, projects that are going to be seen as historical down the line. So, with the historical space where it currently exists, we see a lot of these kind of massive pumps, which I was showing on the chart earlier with the Gary V pump. And then there was one kind of towards the end of last year and around August sees massive pumps and then massive sell-offs and everything die. Although maybe we could gain 10, 20% um, additional user base within the historical space. What do you think we're missing to within the space with, to, to reach these like doodles and bored apes and cool cat type pumps. What, what exactly are we missing? I, I love this one. Um, I, I want to take this one. And this is one I, I got from, I, I learned a lot from John Tory, who, who's a NFT writer in the space. Check out his articles. He helped me learn a lot about just understanding markets and the NFT space as a whole. But for me, it's not the cool kid on the block right now. You know, I like to compare it to sports. You know, um, if let's use basketball for, let's use football, for example. Everybody knows, everybody's listening knows Tom Brady, you know. And then there's a a hot young quarterback, let's say uh, Kyler Murray or Lamar, let's use Lamar Jackson. You know, Lamar Jackson is the hot young kid on the block, but he's not proven. He's never won a Super Bowl. He probably, who if he wins a Super Bowl or not, who knows? But, and a lot of people are probably gonna going to bet on the new kid on the block, on what's hot and what's popular. But over time, when that kid continues to not prove himself or fall off or another kid takes his spot or something else more flashier pops in, they're going to basically cannibalize each other. You know, like, for example, I seen Azuki come in and... and had the the fastest the fastest project to hit a certain eat the mound and another project is going to come in another project and they all continue to flip each other and eventually some of them are, are going to be are going are going to die off and then more are going to pop up and then more are going to die off and then over time investors are going to look back and say wait a minute these curio cards moon cats pepes all these projects have been slowly but steadily increasing users slowly and steadily growing, slowly and steadily, you know, growing their brand, getting bigger, so forth and so on. And then I feel like there's going to come, whether that's two years, five years, 10 years, I don't know. But a lot of investors are going to take a step back and look and say, wait a minute, these are a lot safer bets. 
and better bets than me constantly trying to bet on the new flavor mint of the week and trying to bet on a new project of the week. So I think it just takes time. I think the space needs to grow a little bit more. I think that ones who are invested in historical products, we're, we're all in it for the long run because we could, we, we understand that the thesis, but there's nothing we could do in the current moment. Everybody's focused. This is a very new and speculative market. Everybody's focused on the new mint and what's hot. What's the next board ape yacht club? Not knowing that historical projects is the next board ape yacht club in the sense of, I think the, the return on gains in the next 10 years is going to be astronomical, but it just takes time for the market to mature a little bit more before they realize that. I, I agree. I completely agree. The historicals have also a set of different circumstances and obstacles to overcome. One of them, the primary one that I see is the the owner distribution with the, mm. the new modern NFTs. Everyone mints all of the supplies distributed immediately. Um, you could say it's more similar to like a proof of stake model, whereas historicals are based off of proof of work where you come in and there's already people who own the asset prior to you. So whenever mm. there's a whenever there's an increase in momentum and the price is upswing, they're going to obviously dump into that momentum because that's kind of how NFTs work. So you get these like 90 percent up, 80 percent down kind of swings. Um, which is <laughs> continually happens over and over and over. Eventually that supply will um, be distributed or the, the the new community and the OG holders come to some sort of agreement on how to distribute that. Uh, one, one example I like to use is Pepe Drops had a pretty cool um, way to combat this where a lot of the holders with them, um, you're a curio card holder. So this is very similar to like ERC 1155 semi, semi-fungible at, tokens where um, one of the owners owns like 60, 70% of the supply, whether they're an artist and had it all in the beginning and distributed yep. it and then the project died and they just held on to it. Pepe Drops came up with something where they did a Dutch auction with the X amount, 50% of the supply. And then if it reaches zero, then all of those remaining cards got burnt. So it really found like it's, it's a uh, market value um, within that drop. I'm sure there's more tools and utility that's going to come as well. But also what we're doing is we're filling in the story gaps, which is still not complete. And I think we're still quite a way off with new things that keep popping up left and right. And this is where we get these hype cycles or people say that we're pumping our bags is because everyone thinks like, oh, maybe this has historical significance. And then everyone realizes there's a contract or there's a flaw within the contract. Uh, the owner is a douchebag or the creator is a douchebag or all of these other set of circumstances that, that keep popping up. Um, I thought, I thought we were going to hit the end of the road la at the end of last year with things to find, but then this year we had puny, puny codes and doge parties popping up. There's going to be something else. Emmercoin is now starting to catch some traction. People went and yeah. do dove into like <laughs> data coin and it's not because everyone thinks it has value. Everyone's just trying to explore to see what's there. Most of us, didn't enter the space till 2017 or after some are even, even newer than that. So it's just new information because I don't come from a technological background. I don't, I don't know how to code. Um, I could learn the concepts, but it's, it's just all completely different. So we, the historical space faces its own, um, set of hurdles, which is completely different from, from the newer projects. But one thing I, I do want to note is that I've seen this more recently within the last, I'd say three months as the historical space is beginning to band together and everyone's beginning to collab together. The community is beginning to form a, a very cohesive thesis on, on what it is. Obviously, there, there's outliers, but it's much different than with the modern space where everyone's very tribal, whitelist antics. Um, everyone's competitive, saying their project's better and bashing on each other. It seems completely opposite on this side of the spectrum. Yeah, and, and to piggyback off that, um, you know, I, I sin, I think when they, when they say 99% of projects are going to go to zero and 99% of projects don't have to go to zero, but the reason that's going to happen is because a, a lot of people just simply don't have the business acumen to, to, to run a project and operate a project after mint, you know, they, they could drive up a, a ton of hype, but how do you, can you operate this project in the long run? Can you operate this project for the next 10 to 20 years? And you know, they, they make a million bucks, they make 500 K, they make $10 million. You know, I screw this, fuck that. I'm out, you know, and, and the project's essentially rugged. And that, ha that happens with a lot of new projects are there are, they're not able to innovate fast enough to compete with other projects that are simply going to steal the, the, the spotlight and the shine, but whether all projects go to zero or not, the historical projects will 
always come back to life and will always be relevant in this generation and the next one, you know, in this lifetime and the next one, you know, people will, will go back and look at blockchain history, where which is basically a ledger of transactions of times and dates. People always go back and say, you know, Panda Earth was minted in 2018, Cure Cards 2017, Mooncat 27, Pepe's in 20, whatever. In a, in a in a in a technology where where transaction dates and times matter, these early historical assets will always be relevant. Now, now, what makes some better than than others? I think it's simply the story. And, and how strong that community is and how well they could tell the story of that project. Yeah, the, the modern NFTs are built off of branding and marketing and historical spaces built off of the story, the narrative behind it. Um, what, what type of nostalgia can it feed into? Um, what type of similarities within somebody's own personal life um, can, it, can it bring to somebody? Um, I want to present, I have a question. I want to present this to Mfika. He's been a little bit quiet and talks about semantics. So it's kind of similar. We talk about the newer projects. Everyone's flipping each other. It's very tribal. We saw board apes flip punks, obviously two different domains. One's modern, one's historical, at least for now. Punks are king in the historical space. I guess you could say Pepe's on Bitcoin, but not quite there yet. Do we think, or do you see any historical projects that can unseat the king of, of punks within the historical space? Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I, I think, I think like so. For example, puny codes, right? Like we, we, we're so so new. Like when people really grasp, get to understand exactly how innovative that project was. Like when we have a more sophisticated set of collectors in the space, like what we're currently seeing is, you know, like punks versus some of these earlier collections and like just the, the disparity between the, the market caps of these collections, we'll, we'll, we'll see that, we'll see that start to change. Even like, for example, and I know some people have reservations around umbrella given, given the, 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 the like the physical product hasn't been delivered yet, but if you get to grasp the understanding of like the significance of that token and the fact that if, if we are here for a long term, and NFTs are going to be, you know, physical assets, assets becoming tokenized. You have the first instance of that, of the intention for that, you know, that like a physical asset being tokenized, like that then becomes like, wow, there's only 300 of them. I, I, I just think, yeah, right now is, you know, Kevin saying what has taken NFTs into the mainstream has been PFP projects. But long term, when we get a more sophisticated set of collectors, when we also, and one thing people don't, I think, talk about enough is like when we get institutional money coming into NFTs, then institution small money is not going to be going into like the next flip and those kind of things. They're going to be looking at like a collector's mindset as we all are. So when we start to see institutions then going into NFT collections, yeah, we're going to see a, a, a very big change. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm thinking even things around like, like just on, uh, on Ethereum, I can see Cura cards. Like that's, that's, you know, right now I, I feel like Cura cards are so disrespected, but I think in terms of a collection that, that institutions can, can, can invest in, that's probably one of the best, very easy to understand, very easy to navigate. Um, there's always liquidity somewhere in that, in that, in that market. Right. So I think there's a lot of great things going for, for Cura cards. I just think we, we just don't have a sophisticated enough and, and not to say that people here in the, in, in the space now aren't sophisticated and just saying the mindset is PFP projects, let's mint this flip instead of like I'm vaulting this for a long time, which is what these institutions do. And which is what like investors with, you know, I'm talking about multimillionaires and billionaires. That's what they do with artwork. We haven't seen them much in this space yet, but they're coming. For, yeah, a, a lot of people kind of look past this. They talk about gold being a store of value, but art has actually been a store of value for, for millennia as well, which a lot of people mm -hmm. look past. Kiro Cards mm -hmm. obviously being the first art project on on Ethereum. And I think it's actually one of the leaders within, um, you, I guess you call it institutional money adoption. We've seen multiple million dollar full set Kiro Card sets. Uh, Gary Vee's a big fan. A lot of these other people um, with, with high net worths and and just large social uh, communities as well kind of diving into that um, maybe just because it's it's easier to digest or it's art and it's it just easier to to comprehend but it's gonna it's gonna come a time where yeah these 
these large institutions or maybe even the, the Web3 version of, of DAOs are going to come in and, and start acquiring it. We keep hearing this from, from many people. Gary V again on NFT Now Today's podcast said, uh, if I had to invest today, uh, if I could only choose one class, I would, I would quote unquote, he said, I would purchase Mooncats, Crypto Strikers, and any OG project. Um, so I think that's going to come down at some point. We've also seen from the from the Web2 world, I'll call it, Daryl Morey, who I think is a, a panda holder as well, has come in and yeah, spent... He is. Yeah, he's come in and spent multi-millions of dollars on on historic NFTs. I remember listening to him saying one of his his bets is that he wants to go as far out on the risk curve um, and acquire them all because he believes the overall historic space is just going to grow astronomically. We saw Matt, I think his last name is Kalish or Kalish, one of the co-founders of DraftKings, come in um, like two months ago and also drop multi-millions of dollars on these historic NFTs, and I'm sure there's probably more that just aren't in the, the public limelight. But once that once that does happen publicly, you're going to see a mad rush, and it'll probably never return. I, I use punks, for example. They had four years of community building before they took breakaway speed. And I think that sort of trajectory is only going to be replicated by the majority of these, of these projects because there's not going to be a secondary drop. Board Apes took lightweight speed they're obviously changed the game but they also can have companions with um with mutant apes and board eight or board board ape kennel club but with these historic projects there's no companions that that's it and yeah. it only well, takes a, it only takes a single moment for people to realize that you're giving you're giving me fomo bro. <laughs> I, already, I already spent all my money on historicals I'm, I'm done i have nothing else all my net worth is in historicals but you get you're giving me oh. some fomo bro but yeah I, I i agree with you man i think i think it's is how patient can we be how patient can we be into for this market to mature a bit more and even with with this quote unquote down market um, we've seen a lot of historical projects hold up well. Like I'm talking about Ether Lambos, for example, one of my favorites. Mm-hmm. Um, 2X in this quote unquote uh, uh, bear NFT bear bear market, you have historical projects like Ether Lambos. That's that's 2Xing. Imagine that project in 10 years. You know, imagine imagine somebody in the supply. When you when we take a step back and we look at how there's only probably about 1.5 million NFT wallets that exists right now, probably a little bit more now. I haven't checked since about a month and a half ago, but let's say about 1.5 NFT wallets exist today. What happens when that number is at 10 million, which it will inevitably be within the next couple of months or years? What happens when a hundred million people own NFTs and NFTs is used on a day-to-day basis as social resume, as social media, as when you when you're going through somebody's wallet on a day-to-day basis? And you're talking about the small supply of these historical assets, the 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 demand for them is gonna far outweigh the supply of of these historical assets. And that's when the moonshot is going to happen. So it's just about being patient. And it, I'm pretty, I'm, I know everybody who's in historical NFTs right now are patient because if you weren't, you'll be minting the new flavor of the week. So we, we're patient, but when that happens, we don't know, but man, I, I'm pretty certain it's, it's going to happen. And if it doesn't happen, <laughs> well, I'm, 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 oh. uh, good luck to me, bro. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're, we're all going to be living in a box. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to add something as well. I, you know, this, this notion of supply. So, so, and I absolutely agree with you, Kev, it's like where we're going with these NFTs and, and how many other trends are building on, on top of it, right? Like NFTs and we've got the metaverse and like us living more in a digital world. And so I, I, I've been thinking and looking back at previous kind of, let's say manias, right? We talk about like base, like other collect, like what's it called? trading cards and then you think about like um i forget those little fair babies what were they called oh beanie uh, beanie babies beanie babies yeah like those all, all those different manias right and, and and sort of thinking about what are lessons we can learn from those and where do they apply with nfts i'm finding the one thing that i guess and correct me if i'm wrong jake is like with those previous manias is like it's 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 nfts in the world we're thinking are going to be a, a core part of your daily life, you know, they're going to be like, you're interacting with them daily. It's not like, Oh, you collect them and you just put them at home and you leave them at home. And you, 
look, look at them after work or on the weekend. It's like, no, you use these as access tokens, right? I often think about like the Dirge Party tokens. I know some people in the historical community have concerns that, you know, some of the 2021 tokens that aren't, have got like the 2014 tokens with art add, with added in 2021. I can, I see those, I can easily see those being access tokens of some kind in the future to different events or different communities or different metaverses. And so the ability of NFTs to be so multi-dimensional from being just not just a collector's item that you look at, but it can be like, you need this to access, get access into something, or you can, you can use this to, as, as collateral for lending. There's so many things around it that I think, yeah, the, the, the notion of some of these historicals having such limited supply the demand is going to be crazy. It's going to be crazy. Yeah, that's that's a semantic debate. I just had two of the Doge, the OG Doge Party guys on here, and we were talking about this the same idea of the the token mint date when the art was created versus when the art, um, yeah, when the art was was added. Some people created the art originally, never put it on, then put it on a different date, and then this is the idea of like the the crypto IQ curve, right? It's like the, the 140 IQ and the 40 IQ person kind of end up with the same idea. And the person in the middle, that's the average individual, is the one mad because uh, it didn't play out. And so I kind of think of it in the future um, with with, Do- with uh, Doge Party and with Counterparty Assets. Um, it doesn't matter when the, when the image was created. It was more so when the token was minted. I, I saw this from a lot of Rare Pepe OGs, the saying of the token is the art. And I didn't really get it until I really started dabbling into their ecosystem, which is much different from the, the Ethereum NFTs that exist today. So you really have to kind of understand and wrap your mind around it. And then when you go even farther back to, to Namecoin and Emmercoin, some of these other like registry-based ones, the the token is or the the I guess say the value is within the registry itself, and because it's similar to ENS where it where it expires, but back then there wasn't the type of storage solutions like IPFS, and so they had to go through um, different primitive technologies to kind of get the message across of what they were trying to build back then, and more so with Namecoin, it was literally built uh, it was a Satoshi Nakamoto themselves, whoever it is was part of the conversation of, of forking their own Bitcoin blockchain to, to create a uh, name coin um, ENS or the name service, as well as Vitalik in the original Ethereum white paper mentioning name coin as non-fungible assets. So that ascribes value to it and it has nothing to do with really the token itself. It's just two of the leaders of the, the largest NFT platforms I guess you could say um, anointing Namecoin as non fungible tokens. Love that. Yeah, so that's all. Yeah, the, it's, that. all it's all the story. That's what we do. Um, this is what Panda Earth is doing now. The community gets to write the rest of the story. Uh, I propose this question to um, the community at Realms of Ether on here. Now that you're living out, or you're going to be living after the wrap, we'll call it uh, the next chapter for for Panda Earth inspired by the community and there's no writings of the original dev uh what are the plans for for the next chapter is there anything that you'd like to see is there any sort of narrative in place or is it just going to be very similar to the current nft place where it's just wild wild west and we'll see what happens (laughs) good good question oh we have well we have internally we've got some 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 exciting things that we 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 want to do uh, our view with with Pan Earth has always been like under 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 promise and over deliver, and you can see in, in our Discord how we sort of communicate and 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 how we approach things. But you know, post a wrap, we, we would like to 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 organize a community around something 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 big that's that's going to be of utility for the holders. So as the, these royalties start coming in, obviously, first thing is for us to we start to acquire looking to acquire some some pandas to build out our treasury a little bit more. Um, and then, and then ideally then we look at, you know, whether it is we're, we're buying something, something big, I'm not sure what that will be yet. Um, it's stay tuned, join, join the community, join the discord, check it out. Um, but something that gives utility to, 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 to holders, uh, and something that, that holders can, can gain, gain access to and be beneficial to them. Um, and just directs all of the DAO's resources to that one thing. So we're, we're, we don't know what that one thing is yet, but we're working on it and we want to get as much feedback as we can from the community. How about you, Kev? What, what are your, uh, what's your 
idea or what is a, what does a Panda future look like? Yeah. So for me, I think the Panda future looks like um, how it looked with the rediscovery with the community taking the initiative and driving the project forward are the roots of this project is giving back to pandas and helping save the pandas and the conservation is the roots of this project. Now for me, it's how do we take the original dream and vision of this and how do we 100 X that idea and how do we give back globally or do something really, really massive. We've thrown out a couple ideas um, among the, the mods and among and amongst the, the community. But um, I think it has to be strategically thought out of. I, I know Realms of Ether, for example, it has a very strategic plan of going in and, and buying a castle and turning it to a hotel slash B&B and holding it as a has a as a hall that members could rent out and things of that nature. I think that's fucking amazing when when, when you sit and you think of, that's really cool. Panda Earth, we want to do something even better than that, you know, and 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 shout out to Realms for the inspiration of of going like go big or go home. You get what I'm saying? We want to do something better than that. We want to do something bigger than that. We want to be the best, you know? So when I sit and I think about this, it, it, it's a community effort. It, it's a lot of brainstorming, a lot of thought that goes into it. I just don't want to, you know, randomly say something just as, as like marketing or as a cash grab, you know, I want to say something. I want us to do something that the community is, is aligned with that we're all passionate about and that we'll actually execute on for the next 20 years or, or at least for the, for the rest of this lifetime that I'm alive for. So, um, whatever it is, uh, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put my all into it. And, um, yeah, so that's, that's my vision for, for this community. The Panda conservatory is coming. That's the, that's yeah. the, that's the next step. <laughs> <laughs> well, gentlemen coming up on time, I appreciate both of you for coming on and, uh, helping continue, um, or fill in the gaps of the, the Panda story, continuing to grow. I'm a member of the community, so I'm excited to see um, once the, the, the wrapping wars happen so that I could get that, that first 100 PO app. That'll be interesting to see if it raised gas or anything like that. Um, but where, for all those who are listening where can I uh, or watching, where can I direct them to follow each of you or get involved with Panda Earth? Wait, is this live? Oh, this is not live. No. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. <laughs> I gotcha. Well, you, you could you could follow the pandas at Panda Earth NFT um, on Twitter. Uh, we post all our major updates on Panda Earth NFT on Twitter. Turn those post notifications on, and uh, you won't miss the beat. And you can follow me on my personal page at Kev for King. Yeah. How about you, Mafika? Yeah. Uh, and you can you can you can get at me at Mafiko NFT, uh, yeah on Twitter. I'm, I'm I'm I'll be there. Hey, legends in the building, history is on our side. Thank both of you guys for for joining me, and for all of the, you who are listening or watching out there. We'll catch you next time.